Pete Gregg, thank you so much for joining us, man. It's so good to be here. Uh, a friend to me, in many ways a spiritual father to me, uh, a mentor, someone that I look up to. And uh, I have brought in one of the leading voices on prayer to talk about when prayer doesn't seem to work <laughs> at all. Uh, so uh, I devote a chapter in Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools to what I call silence and persistence. Yeah. And I chose that language intentionally, but w what's more commonly called unanswered prayer. Uh, I, I devoted a chapter to it. You've devoted an entire book to it. Uh, more recently, The Prayer Course Part 2, which is entirely on this topic. And so I, I want to delve the depths of unanswered prayer with you because anyone that is going to take prayer seriously is going to run headlong into the most mysterious aspect of prayer. And that is when God doesn't seem to be who I thought he was. God doesn't seem to be doing what I thought he would do or what I think he should be doing. And suddenly a space that is filled with intimacy and power becomes confused with confusion and maybe even what can feel like betrayal right. or at least silence. Right. Um, so I, I really want to begin with, with the question. Um, so let's start on the pages of scripture and then maybe move more personal from there. But where do we see unanswered prayer in the Bible? And what is the question or the questions that it leaves us with in Scripture? Well, it's a great question because the, the Bible is far more honest about unanswered prayer than the church generally is. Um, you've got maybe half of the Psalms that, that are lament. Mm -hmm. You've got an entire book of the Old Testament called Lamentations. You've got you know, 400 years of silence between the Old and the New Testament. And lots of other examples, but let's focus in on Jesus. There are yeah. probably four unanswered prayers that Jesus experienced. There's the time he prayed for the blind man, it only half worked. And he had to then pray for him again to be healed. That was the one, I, I see people, but they look like they trees. They look like trees, which yeah. isn't really what people look like. So, yeah. you know, and, and so uh, then the next one is Jesus, of course, in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, because you might say about the other one, well, he only had to pray twice and he saw yeah. a supernatural miracle. But there he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating blood. His soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Mm -hmm. And he says, take this cup from me. You know, I, I don't want to be the guy in 10,000 stained glass windows dying on a cross. I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. Give me a plan B. <laughs> and and God clearly doesn't answer that that, that prayer. And then on the cross is another kind of unanswered prayer, which is where he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So this is the moment one theologian said, Christ became the atheist in this moment, this sense of the distance of God, the absence of God, the abandonment by God. And then the fourth one, which I, I should have put earlier in the list, but I haven't for, for a particular reason, is where Christ, before Garden of Gethsemane, before the cross, his great high priestly prayers. Hmm. And he, his great prayer is, let them be one. Let the yeah, church unity. be united. Right. And, and the reason I put that one last is that one I find most extraordinary because it's ongoing. Mm -hmm. Like, w sadly, we can all see that the church is still divided. And this wasn't just a nice prayer. This was like one of the key requests right. that Christ made to the Father. So it seems to me if Jesus could live with unanswered prayer and continues to live with unanswered prayer in heaven today, then we as Christians don't need to be ashamed if we sometimes live with tensions, with disappointments, with questions of God. So, um, you know, the, the, the scriptures are full of these questions that we all ask. And I, I want to say really clearly to wrestle with unanswered prayer is an act of faith. Hmm. You know, some people say, in fact, you know, I wrote a book all about miracles because the start of the 24 seven prayer movement, well, we still see loads of miracles, but right. we certainly saw a lot then. It was, you know, incredible. And it was called Red Moon Rising. And then I, my wife got very, very sick and suddenly my prayers weren't working mm -hmm. and so I wrote this book that she she asked me to write it. She couldn't find a book that would s speak to where she was at. Did she, she, Sammy ask you to write yeah, the book? Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Yeah, because she found that the books on, on this subject, on, on suffering and unanswered prayer, 
were either heavyweight theological tomes, which she just couldn't handle lying in hospital. Yeah. Or they were kind of Reader's Digest, twee, little yeah. quotes. And, and she wanted something that treated her with intelligence, but wasn't too difficult to read. So I, yeah. I ended up, we really couldn't find it. So I, 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 I wrote that for her. And it seems to have helped a lot of, a lot of people uh, to process their questions. And, 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 so, and one famous pastor's wife said to me when she heard I was writing this book called God on Mute, uh, you mustn't write that. You're the guy who, 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 who tells us that prayer works, a bit like your introduction today. Yeah. You must, you'll disappoint so many people if you are honest about the unanswered prayer. But I feel really strongly that it, you know, if you're an atheist and your prayers don't work, it just confirms that there isn't a God. To wrestle with this is because we do believe in God's goodness. And what's been really encouraging is how the message of that book and your your chapter in in, in your book is absolutely outstanding on this. It's it's so good. I I, I underlined loads of it. It this, this is a message that helps Christians to find God in greater complexity mm. and helps people who may even have abandoned God because he didn't come through for them when they needed it to find a way back to him, but perhaps in a slightly less neat or um, a more paradoxical way. Yeah, so it, where scripture speaks of unanswered prayer, what, uh, I guess, what questions does it answer or what pieces does it give us to work with and what does it leave mysterious? Well, there are some reasons for unanswered prayer that, that, that we can answer. Some people just think it's all mystery and we've just got to shrug and right. hope for the best. But, but there are some things we need to talk about. This. C.S. Lewis is, is brilliant on, on some of this. Mm -hmm. You know, in the book, I talk about God's world, God's will, God's war. God's world, first of all, God has just set the world up to abide by certain principles. So, um, you know, I, I support a, a soccer team called Portsmouth that often loses soccer matches. And if I'm crying out, you know, for them to win a match and then the, the other side, the, the supporters are crying out. for them. God's not going to intervene. He's not going to micromanage. He's just going to let the best team win. And so, um, you know, the law of gravity, you know, God loves us to bits, but if something heavy is dropping towards our big toe, he's not going to make it float. So, so, so we, you know, miracles have to be rare. That's what C.S. Lewis says. And some preachers make out that they're not, that miracles are there if you just pray in the right way. And, yeah. you know, you always, and it's just not true. It's also not biblical, by the way. Because a miracle fundamentally violates the laws of the universe. So if that were to by be definition. common, it would cease to be a miracle. By, by, by definition. And I would want to, without wanting to go too esoteric, I'd want to step back and say, what could be more miraculous than waking up as a sentient being in a body on a rock in this stunningly beautiful universe? I mean, life is a miracle. So we even need to reframe, you know, is the law of gravity not kind of miraculous? So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. but yes. So, 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 so that there's, there's, there's God's world works in certain ways. And as Christians, we're not immune from the overarching principles of, of life. And then there's God's will sometimes, and this can hurt like hell. God's will is that we suffer. And, and we have to have a theology of the cross. We have to have a yes. theology of suffering. And so many Christians don't. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know... We, we may not understand sometimes why God has made us go through things. The ultimate example is the one I just gave you, Jesus saying, take this cup from me. But that unanswered prayer becomes the greatest miracle, the greatest answered prayer for humanity ever because through Christ's death, you know, forgiveness, salvation comes. So, um, you know, um, Billy Graham's wife said she's very glad that God sometimes says no to our prayers or she'd have married the wrong man three times. So, you know, God's will. And I don't say it glibly because sometimes it can be agony when God wants something different to what we want and need. Mm -hmm. But then, and this is important, the third one, and this is the one that a lot of Christians miss out, they're fine with what I've said so far, but is God's war. We have to understand that there is an enemy still at loose, still working in our world, who is contesting the goodness of God's will all the time. And what that means is 
terrible things happen that God doesn't want to happen. And, uh, and you know, we, we, we see this all around us all the time. There are things that are clearly not the will of God that go on in the world. And so that's one of the reasons we have to keep praying and sometimes we have to persevere in prayer, as, mm -hmm. as your book says, because um, it is a battle. Ephesians 6, our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in, in heavenly places. And so uh, God's world, God's will, God's war. And, and, and a lot of the things we're struggling with, we can you know, categorize in one of those three ways. Yeah, and when we pray, we are praying into those three variables, all yeah. influencing what's happening with our prayers. Yes, 100%. And some people just think, oh, it's just God. And if God wants it to happen, he's all loving, all powerful, it'll happen. Yeah. And so if that's your view, then why bother praying? Mm -hmm. Some people go a little more complex. They say, well, I think it's something to do with kind of human free will as well. So maybe I should pray about that. But then you get in and a very... Maybe God's more likely to do it if I ask, or yeah. ask the right way or ask at yes. the right time or ask enough times. And yeah. yeah, but it kind of comes very transactional, right. a bit like we're trying to persuade God. That's why we have to remember that there is another willpower at work here. Mm -hmm. There's an evil willpower at work in our world. And, and this is very important, and it touches on your earlier question. Ultimately, um, when Jesus returns, the battle will, that was won on the cross will, will conclude. Yeah. And, and there'll be no more you know, cancer, no more sickness and suffering and dying and all of that. But until then, we're in this in-between stage where we have to fight because there is a battle like not fighting isn't really an option we all know the daily battle with temptation we all see the evil at work in our world and so we we preach the gospel uh, we pray for god's will to be done because it's not automatic it is contested yes yeah, so i, I want to talk to you about waiting because it prayer just involves waiting and uh sometimes prayer involves waiting in ways that we ultimately decide are good yeah. Usually that happens when uh, I prayed and prayed and prayed, then saw something given, but also I can identify things God gave me along the journey of yeah. the waiting. Other times, waiting becomes incredibly painful um, because we are still in that place of waiting or because I waited and waited and waited and then what I was longing for I didn't see come to pass despite yeah. the fact that I was praying. So... You know, most of the time when people are really interested in the subject of unanswered prayer, they're in a state of waiting where they are praying about something. Like, we know one another well enough that I know your story with Sammy's illness. You know my story with my son's illness. Yeah. And there is just praying and waiting and praying and waiting. Yeah. So what do we do as believers in the time of waiting? Mm. Well, the first thing is, and you talk about this in, in, in the book, Jesus explicitly told certain parables to say that we must keep praying and not give up. So mm -hmm. the, the first thing is, is, is keep praying. And um, there is a merit in you know, Frank Laubach, the great educationalist mm -hmm. missionary, the only missionary ever featured on American postage stamp. Frank Laubach uh, talks about chucking rocks in a swamp and they just disappear. It seems pointless. And often praying these prayers again and again is like chucking rocks in a swamp. But eventually, if you keep doing it, one appears on the surface and then another yeah. and you can walk across. And so that's the first thing is persevere. The second thing in the waiting is, um, it, it is uh, don't get isolated. Mm. There's something about suffering that makes us want to curl up in a ball and hide. It's vulnerability, right? We don't like to expose the, 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 the soft parts of, of our lives to, 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 to the elements. And, and actually, um, when we're waiting, we need to push into fellowship and, and really ask others to, as it were, stand with us and wait with us, mm -hmm. even over the years. Because there's been times where I just ran out of prayers. For, you yeah. know, Sa Sammy's... Sammy's had a chronic illness now for 21 years. That's a lot of praying. Yeah. I, I mean, even if, you know, if I went through every word in, in the Roger's thesaurus, I've used them all. Like, there's no, there's no fresh way. There's, you know, I prayed all the obvious scriptures. So, yes, I keep chucking rocks in the swamp, but 
I can't tell you how much it means that there are people out there who say, you know what, we've got faith for Sammy to be healed, mm-hmm. uh, even if you don't. So we're taking the pressure off you. And because sometimes our job is just to get up and just get on with life. You know, right. if we are living in a continual sense of um, having to get our faith up for something, it, it would have broken us by, by now. Some days we just have to say, you know what, we're just going to get on with life. But it means so much there are others that are waiting with us. So don't get isolated. Well, And, and of course, yeah. there's ways that community can be painful yeah. in the waiting. You know, there's the, is there anything I can do? And, and it's almost like community becomes a burden or I'm projecting a yeah. a trope onto your story. Yeah. But there's also ways, and there's no way to protect yourself from that. I think just know that, People try to love you, and some people do it well, and others don't do it so well. But there's there's also ways it's incredibly healing. Like, I know when we went through a very painful, prolonged yeah. illness with one of our children, you and Sammy were some among many who came and sat with us and prayed words when Kirsten and I had run out of words. And it, it, it is life-giving to hear others, particularly others that have been in the wrestle mm. and that are familiar with waiting themselves yeah. to pray out of their own empathy for that state that yeah. people are in. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think in those situations, I know for Sammy, she she doesn't want any just anyone to pray for her. Mm-hmm. Like she, she has had to develop a little bit of a guard. If there's, you know, in a church service, an invitation to come forward to receive prayer for healing she doesn't always go forward but there are times where she either just feels i really trust this person Mm -hmm. or there's kind of a a surge of faith Mm -hmm. of like i think i'm i think i want to receive prayer right now and so we've learned just to be quite sensitive to go with ebb and flow not not in any way feel we might miss out if you know, we don't go to Bethel or we don't go to Lourdes so we yeah. don't, you know, renounce Freemasonry or whatever whatever the superstitious thing is that, you know, you, you get worried that at some points that you're going to, you, you might get eliminated on a technicality. <laughs> like, <laughs> I didn't do all the right stuff. Yeah. This stuff is not transactional. So just have a bit of grace of like, in the moment, who do I trust? Who Who do I not really trust to be that vulnerable with? Find your core friends. Remember, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane had the 12, but it was the three that he asked to come and watch yes. and pray with him. So we yes. all need that. Yes. And it's, was there another? So you were talking about we keep praying. Yeah, don't get isolated. Wait with others. Um, and, um, you know, Corrie ten Boom, who, who was in Ravensbrück, you know, the, the, the concentration camp, lived through the Holocaust. So she knew a thing or two about yeah. suffering. And one of her beautiful little simple uh, um, analogies, she says, if you're on a train and it goes into a tunnel, that's not the time to get off the train. Mm. So sometimes when everything goes dark and we feel disorientated, just stay within that which you knew to be true mm. and it will eventually bring, and wait you, for the br- light. bring you through. Right. So don't, don't um, you know, be true to the, the scriptures, the, you know, all of that. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, one thing I've heard you talk about that I've been really helped by is when we're in a state of enduring the silence of God or the perceived silence of God, we often think an answer will heal us, right? If I only understood what God is thinking here or why, but Jesus uses questions in scripture to bring the deepest kind of healing to people. So can you talk a little bit along those lines? Because I find it helpful, or I found it helpful to look for the deepest rooted question within me as I'm waiting. Because it's often not, God, why would my mother get a cancer diagnosis, hypothetically? It's, how do I square this with your goodness? God, are you good? Yeah, you yeah. know, it's a, it's a deeper question. Yeah. So can you talk, speak to that some? Yeah, we have to reframe the question why to the question where. Hmm. Uh, and um, sometimes we just can't understand why. It's instinctive. God, why is this happening? But actually a, a far more constructive question to, that you can always ask when you're struggling and suffering is, God, where are you? in this situation and he's promised i'll never leave you i'll never forsake you 
And so for Sammy and me, um, you know, if we said, God, why is a, tu a brain tumor growing in Sammy's skull when we have a seven-week-old baby? There's not a lot of answers to that. Right. But where are you for us right now in this situation? You know, I remember the day we were just desperate. And the mail came and a church maybe five, six hours away from us had all signed like this card saying they were praying for us. It sounds silly, but that was evidence of the presence and the love of God. Or mm -hmm. suddenly a, a Christian nurse comes to our bedside. So just little things that were like, okay, God, all I need to know, I don't actually need to understand this. I just need to know you're with me. And as kids, we learned to do, all of us did this as kids. You know, we, we, we could trust that which we did not understand. Mm -hmm. As we get older, we think, I must understand and then I can trust. And it's right. not true. You are fully equipped to trust even when you don't understand. So it's not easy, but sometimes we have to relinquish that part of us that wants everything explained and just say, where are you, God? Show yourself to me. Show me evidence of your love. And the, the analogy that you'll have heard me use sometimes is, you know, our instinctive prayer is always, God, would you airlift me out of the crisis? Yes. And he does. We call them miracles. But more often he parachutes in and joins us, right. which is Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil way, for thou art with me. So mm -hmm. it's that, where are you? Oh, God is with me in the MRI tube. God is with me on the day that, I lose the job that I felt he'd given me. Somehow I find his presence with me. Yeah, you know, my my experience has been, and this will sound cheap unless you've experienced it, and then it will make sense, but that the things I've endured so far in my life are endurable if I can find Jesus in them with me. Yeah. It's like the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Like yeah. I think I think somehow yeah. when you put me in that fire. I'm going to be delivered. Yeah. But even if I'm not, yeah. I know there's a fourth in the fire, yeah. right? And if, if I can know God's presence in it with me. So I, I had someone say to me once, everything you experience is an invitation to intimacy with Jesus. Yeah. It just, if you ask that question where, yeah. you can meet Jesus in a deeper way in circumstances you'd never choose. Yeah, and sometimes it's messy because it's, it's very easy to sort of sentimentalize suffering. And yeah. mostly suffering just makes me want to eat a lot of Big Macs and sin. You know, it's like, right. it, it's not necessarily, if people want to turn those who suffer into saints so that they can feel like it'll never happen to them. Yeah. It's just humanity. Mm -hmm. But, um, some of that intimacy is like Jacob wrestling with God. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, I've talked very openly about the, the, the night that I really prayed more irreverently than I ever had done before and said to God, I know I'm supposed to pray, not my will, but yours be done for Sammy. And I, I said, no deal. I don't care what your will is. God, let me tell you what my will is. My will is that my wife doesn't die. My will is that my kids know their mom. My will is whatever you've got on your heavenly wall planet, I don't care. I'm going to fight you for it. <laughs> and um, I was weeping and was angry. And for many weeks afterwards, I felt ashamed because I felt in my darkest moment that instead of praying the really Jesus, you know, not my will, but yours, I yeah. prayed the opposite. I just yeah. thought I'm just not a very good Christian. And God's so kind. And eventually he spoke to me one day and he said, you know that prayer? I said, yeah, I'm sorry. He said, I loved it. Mm. He said, I loved that you're willing to fight for your wife. I wanted you to fight for your wife. And so sometimes the intimacy with God is is a wrestling yeah. and a, a, an honest lament and a willingness to... We're too good at Christianity, you know, just to <laughs> be a human being yeah. with, with, with my maker. And David's prayers should give you permission to be a human being with your maker. Isn't Nothing it, else does. Isn't it amazing what they didn't redact from the text? Yes. You know... It, the, the Bible does a lousy job at PR. You know, it's like, <laughs> Peter, we'll build the whole church on this dude. And there he is trying to talk Jesus out, out, of, out of the cross. Right. I mean, it, it's extraordinary. It's viscerally honest. Mm -hmm. 
So I'd love to land with this. What keeps hope alive in the midst of waiting? As we're enduring the silence of God, as we're trusting his characters, we're asking the question where, what it, where is our ultimate hope still resting this side of eternity yeah. in the mystery of silence and persistence? People who haven't suffered too much will think that what I'm about to say is escapist. And those who suffered a lot will realize this is ultimate reality. Mm. We believe in life after death. Mm -hmm. We believe that, you know, we're, we're all dying. Like we're all time bombs waiting to go off. Everybody suffers, but only those who know Jesus Christ who died and rose from the grave, have hope not just for this life, but for the next. And there's this beautiful um, account in Revelation chapter 5, as you, you talk mm -hmm. about in chapter 9 of your book, this beautiful image of these golden bowls in heaven being filled up with our intercessions. Yes. And then eventually at the end of the age, they're inverted. And I just imagine this big, oh, man. Yes. And, and I think that, for example, as I pray for someone to be healed of cancer, every one of those prayers is eternal. It's heard by God. It's like radioactive. It keeps generating energy. And it's it, like collected it's, and treasured by it, God. Yeah. It, so he, he gathers them in. And then one day the bowl gets emptied out. And it's not just a cancer, but cancer, generic is destroyed with the return of Christ. And so um, so we, we believe, as, as people of the Bible, that our prayers temporarily